Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon, and then I post it up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated here in Remind of Mind Alone, they do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. I'd like to thank my sponsor, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. They're an online therapy company. They are international. Um, all you got to do is go on, fill out a couple of questions. They'll place you with a therapist here in the US of A. If you are here in the US of A and you don't like the therapist you are seeing, go to betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. They're affordable. They will put you with a therapist in your state that is licensed, professional, master's level, or PhD level. And there they are, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. Awesome. All right. Let's dive into the question. So I want to continue answering the question that I got <clears throat> on Sunday, which was, is there a correlation between uh, narcissism, tra having traits of narcissism, either strong or full-blown, and Alzheimer's? And surprisingly, apparently, yes. Learn something new every day. So I went online and all I did was put in, is there a correlation between narcissism and Alzheimer's? What I found were several studies that have been done uh, this is called the Austin Journal of L Clinical uh, Neurology. And the title of the research article is Narcissism Vulnerability as a Risk Factor for Alzheimer's Disease, a Prospective Study. And basically, they did find a correlation. So, um, But correlation does not always mean causation. So just because you have narcissism does not mean you're necessarily going to get Alzheimer's. But there seems to be a correlation. So if you are interested in reading these, and this study was huge, so I was just like, I'm not going to read it, but I will see, you know, if there is a, yes, there is. So um, if you are interested in learning more, go to the Austin Clinical uh, Journal of Neurology, and it is a uh, narcissism vulnerability as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, a prospective study. So that was a really interesting article. I didn't read the whole thing. I just was like scanning, scanning, scanning. Yes, that answers the question. There we go. So um, yeah, apparently there is a correlation, but correlation does not mean causation. So just be aware of that. Okay. Um, what was I thinking? Oh, questions. Okay, so let me get over to the questions. Hang on. All right. Um, how do you know when you're making a decision based on trauma? There's usually a lot of fear involved usually a lot of fear involved. So decisions based on trauma are usually fear-based. So again, the gut doesn't do fear. The gut basically is a yes or no answer to a yes or no question. The head and the heart are the ones that do fear. So the head and the heart are the ones that are going to be like, oh my God, blah, 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 you know, and all these story, huge amounts of story. So you want to listen to your gut. The gut is usually a calm yes or no answer to a yes or no question. So making decisions based on trauma is usually fear. And it's usually along the lines, if you can really tune into your thoughts, it's usually along the lines of this happened to me before in the past. I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen again. I'm going to do this. And it's usually a trauma, trauma decision. So you want to be very careful of that. Um, traumas, decisions based on traumas usually also are snap decisions. They're, they're usually impulsive. So not always, but usually. So you really want to slow things down and ask your gut. Not your head, not your heart. These two guys tell stories. Ask your gut. So that's what you want to be doing. Okay. Uh, is it normal for a boyfriend to discuss the relationship problems with his 20-year-old daughter? Good God, no. So, again, boundaries. Boundaries. So, no. Children don't need to know relationship issues. They don't. I mean, if, if it's a current boyfriend and he's discussing the issues that you two are having with the daughter, that's a little weird. That's, that's really weird because it's really, it's none of the daughter's business and it's too much children don't need to be involved in their parents relationship so um yeah that's a little weird that's, that's you know and again what i find that uh personality disordered abusers do is they involve the kids in all of this emotional stuff they use the kids as a therapist they use the kid as a sounding board they use the kid they use the kid let's just stop it at that they use the kid 
So um, that's kind of a, a concern, so to put it mildly. Um, the adult child is interested. Oh, this isn't a question that I, this is a question that I had answered on Sunday. Uh, the adult child is interested in family therapy, but also shares everything with the narc, uh, which triggers him. Any ideas? Well, you know, again, this is why I'm saying if you do decide to go to thera family therapy, there needs to be rules. There needs to be boundaries. And the therapist needs to lay down the rule that this is not discussed with the other parent. This is this is between you two. Because if he's getting going to get triggered, or he or she is going to get triggered and start interfering in the therapy, well, that's exactly what their goal is. So um, whenever, and what I've seen happen is that the healthy parent will get the child, the adult child, into therapy, they start working on it, the child goes back to the narcissist, tells them what's happening, they come unglued because they're losing power and control. They don't have absolute control over that kid anymore. So they get triggered and then they start causing problems, encouraging them to quit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that all needs to be discussed up front with the therapist, you know, in front of the therapist, you know, look, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna run back to your dad or your mom and you're gonna tell them what we're doing and I can guarantee you they're gonna tell you to stop going to therapy. And then let the therapist, you know, validate that. Yes, that is what abusers do, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm listening to the Roomba and I'm like, is that a normal noise or is it doing something it shouldn't? Anyway, um, so, um, okay, where was I? Okay, that answered. So really you wanna bring up all of these concerns in front of the daughter with the therapist so that everybody, there's no secrets, there's no you know, weirdness going on, there's no Etc. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's exactly what you want to do. Okay, let me get to the other questions that I have gotten. Okay, um, my friend becomes hostile. If I don't text or call immediately, what should I do? Okay, this, this is the day for boundary questions. So our society has stopped teaching manners. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. With the advent of smartphones, social media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there seems to be this expectation of instant gratitude and instant reciprocation and instant this and instant that. And that is not the way of life. So if somebody is becoming hostile if you don't text or call immediately you're going to draw a boundary so whoever this is male or female you're going to be like look i'm not always going to answer the phone immediately because i'm not always available so drop the attitude or we're done period and this is the thing so many people are so afraid to make a strong boundary like that because they're like oh but i'll lose the person ah but are you really losing anything if they're becoming hostile if you're not jumping to answer their text or jumping to answer their call. Think about it. So you, you make them aware of it. You know, hey, I've noticed that this is happening and I'm letting you know that I'm not gonna accept that attitude from you anymore and I'm not always gonna be available to answer and I will get back to you in an hour or two sometimes or more. You know, so sometimes, for example, if I'm super busy, you know, people will text me or call me or, you know, shoot me an IM or whatever. And there's been a couple of people that if I didn't answer immediately, they'd start sending question marks. And I blew up at them because I was like, look, I work a full time job. I'm not going to get back to you. I'll get back to you in a business day. Bye. You know, <laughs> and then I'll get back to them when I can. But if I'm with clients, I'm sorry, my clients come first. You know, and don't you sit there and get angry at me because I'm not immediately texting you back. That's a narc move. That's a narc behavior. That's a flea that's been taught to the children of narcissists. Jump when I say jump, ask how high, get back to me immediately. So you want to make them aware first. Let's test the water. Let's make them aware. Hey, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but you're doing this. And that's kind of what I did with the people that were sending me question marks. I was like, look, I'm busy. I will get back to you when I can, and it won't be today. There's your expectation, won't be today. 
So do you see where I'm going with that? So you let them know. It's like, hey, you've been doing this. That's not okay. And I'll get back to you when I can, but it might not be for a few hours or even until the next day. There's the expectation. And then if they continue to do that after that, you block them. You be done. You be done. Be done. Be done. So yeah, this is a boundary issue. And this is also kind of a, are they narcissistic? Is this, is this their narcissism coming through? Or is this a learned behavior that they've gotten from their abusive parents or what's going on? Okay. Uh, is it possible to give yourself too much positive affirmations? No. So here's the thing. Positive affirmations are not BS. What narcissists do is they tell themselves a line of crap. They are constantly telling themselves how great they are and how, you know, they're right, everyone's wrong, blah, 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 which obviously is not true. True positive affirmations are just you liking you. Hi, good to see you. Have a great day. I give you permission to like yourself. That's a positive affirmation. Or, gosh, I really like your glasses. Those are really cool. Or, gosh, I really like your hair. That's really cool. Or, gosh, I really like, you know, those are positive affirmations for you. It's not going to cause you to become a narcissist. Let's be clear. Narcissists are generally born without empathy. They do not feel the way the rest of us do. I can't even begin to, well, okay, let's, let me begin to describe this to you. They feel, but their feelings are mm, warped, I think is a good way to put it. They don't feel love the way you and I do. They don't feel any emotion the way you and I do. So their feelings are inaccurate. They're warped. They're not true. And they tell themselves the biggest lies and they believe it. They make themselves believe it. They tell those lies over and over again, hoping that other people will believe it. So no, you cannot give yourself too many positive affirmations. It's a great way to start the day. Positive affirmations are self-esteem. Demanding other people tell you stuff is other esteem. Lying to yourself is delusional. Okay. You know, that would be like, you know, looking in the mirror and going, um, you know, I don't know, something that's not you, right? You know, something that you would not do or say or whatever, and trying to convince yourself of it. That's, that's delusional. That's narcissism. That's what narcissists do, you know, but positive affirmations are just you reaffirming who you are and what is good about you. What do you like about you? What's awesome about you? You know, that's what positive affirmations are about. Narcissists, on the other hand, are constantly going, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Everybody tell me. Other esteem, other esteem, other esteem, other esteem. Positive affirmations are just you bolstering you up in a way that you probably didn't get when you were a kid. So no, you cannot give yourself too many positive <laughs> affirmations. Now, if you start believing that you're emperor of the world, yeah, there might be a problem that's delusional. Does that make sense? So um, yeah, so, and a lot of times people are worried that they are narcissists when they say nice things to themselves. No, you are not. Saying nice things to yourself is what healthy people do. So healthy people are kind to themselves. Healthy people are positive to themselves. Healthy people say nice things to themselves and do not feel weird about it. Narcissists, on the other hand, like to make their targets of abuse feel as if they are being selfish and arrogant and nasty by saying nice things about themselves because the narcissist can't stand it. They don't want you to have self-esteem. That's why they tear you down when you say nice things for you or when you buy nice things for you or when you do the nice things for you. Well, why didn't you give it to me? You're so selfish, blah, 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 blah. Or how dare you say that about yourself? That's not true, blah, blah, blah. And so they lie. They lie and say that you're not beautiful or you're not smart or you're not this or you're not that or you're whatever because they're trying to tear you down so that they can control you. So yeah, positive affirmations are never it's never possible to give yourself too many. Do it as often as you can. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. That's the, how we do it on time here. I got to check the time. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, all right. Um, how are they able to recruit so many flying monkeys to drink their Kool-Aid? Well, again, let's go back to how they do the ego defense. 
So remember, they, they lie, they have excuses, they rationalize, uh, plausible deniability, they, <laughs> you know, and they project this aura of authority and believing what they're saying, even though they're lying, you know, and people who have been raised by narcissists, again, or you're looking at that identifying with the aggressor thing, they identify with the aggressor. So it's kind of a Stockholm syndrome. So when somebody is identifying with an abuser, I question what their childhood was like. So yeah, so that's how they do it. You know, they lie, they're aggressive, they're intimidating, that's their stock and trade. And the flying monkeys probably are doing the identifying with the aggressor in order to stay safe. So there that is. I really think there's a lot of people out there in the general population that have been raised by disordered parents. And yeah, they're, they're, they're susceptible to that identifying with the aggressor thing. Absolutely. All right. Um, if you were raised by a personality disordered parent, do you pick up their behaviors? Yes, it's called fleas. So when we're with somebody, and we can pick up the behaviors from a romantic partner as well, when we're with somebody and we're with them for a long time, the partners tend to start looking like each other. I'm sure you've heard those studies. And, you know, they have similar uh, gestures. They have similar ways of talking, similar, you know, you start picking up each other's behaviors and good or bad, you know, and if you're with a narcissist, you've been raised by a narcissist, you will pick up some of their fleas. You just got to squish them. You just, as soon as you recognize the behavior that you're like, ooh, that reminds me of mom. Ooh, that reminds me of dad. Ooh, I don't like it. Okay, need to get with a therapist, need to start working on it, need to get rid of it. So CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker, um, The Diseased Please, Harriet Breaker, uh, uh, The Self-Esteem Workbook, Glenn Schiraldi, uh, You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones, uh, Codependent No More, Beyond Codependent No More, both by Melanie Beatty, all great books. Uh, Inner Child Workbook, Lucia Cappuccioni or uh, Catherine Taylor, any of those books would be great. So start working on all of those childhood issues, all of those behaviors that you learned that you don't want to be doing anymore. So yeah, you can get rid of them. If they can be learned, they can be unlearned, which is the good news. Okay. Um, oh dear. This kind of goes along with the other question. I feel selfish. Oh, here comes the Roomba. Uh, I feel selfish when I do self-care. What is going on? Okay. We have been told so often and for so long by the abuser that we're not worthy and we don't deserve good things and how dare we do nice things for ourselves, etc., 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 that when we do nice things for ourselves, we feel selfish. How often did the abuser, as a kid, if you were raised by narcissistic parents, how often did that parent steal your uh, money that you earned from working? You know, I see a lot of narcissistic parents doing that, you know, demanding that you be the breadwinner in the family. They don't want to work anymore. You have to take care of the family. You have to raise the kids. You have to, you have to, you have to. And how dare you hang out with your friends and have fun? Whew. There are pieces of work that belong in a toilet. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's why we feel selfish when we do self-care because we've never allowed ourselves to recognize our own worth what is our own worth you know yep sorry i'm watching the roomba go around my desk um so glenn Schiraldi, <coughs> the self-esteem workbook there is a section in that workbook that is all about self-worth what is your worth what is your value do you understand that you have worth and value. Do you get that? Do you understand that? And people who understand that they have worth and value understand that it's okay to do self-care. In fact, not only is it okay, it's mandatory. You gotta take care of yourself. Oops, okay. You gotta take care of yourself, you got to. It's kind of like you cannot pour from an empty pot. If you're pouring tea, you gotta replenish the water in the tea. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be able to keep pouring. If we don't take care of ourselves, we're going to keel over. And honestly, again, this is why the narcissists do this to us and tell us that we're selfish for taking care of ourselves. People who are well-rested, people who are taking care of themselves, understand their worth and will not put up with abuse. 
So that's why they try to get us to not take care of ourselves. We're exhausted all the time. They keep us from sleeping. They keep us from taking care of ourselves. They keep us from exercising. They keep us from uh, eating healthy. They uh, prevent us from seeing our friends. They isolate. And this is all to keep us off balance and not recognizing our own worth. Because if we recognized our own worth, we'd stand up to them and say no and I mean it. And we'd leave. So, yeah, think of it that way. Recognize your value. Get this. Get the Glenn Schiraldi book, the uh, self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Start working it. Recognize your own value. Absolutely. Okay. Um, ooh, okay. I dissociate when I start working on all the trauma. How do I not dissociate? Okay, so a lot of this work you can do um, on your own. Absolutely. Honestly, I think it's a really good idea if you're finding yourself dissociating, get with a trauma therapist. EMDR is really good. EFT is really good. Um, uh, oh, there was another. So, uh, was, it, uh, was it somatic? Oh, I can't remember. Anyway, there's a bunch of different modalities that are really good, but do get with a trauma therapist. A lot of this stuff can be done on your own, but dissociating, <coughs> excuse me, is, is uh, something that you're going to need help with from a trauma therapist. So, you know, what's going on? What about this trauma that you're working on caused you just to dissociate? How old are you? What are you feeling? Where do you go? What's going on? You know, that kind of thing. So um, get with a good trauma therapist. Really, truly get with a good trauma therapist and start working on the dissociation. Start, you know, working on how to stay in the present and be okay. Because dissociating doesn't always mean slipping into another personality. Sometimes dissociating is the thousand mile stare. So I've got a few clients that when we start working on really heavy duty um, abuse that was going on, they'll stop and they'll just stare. And I have to be like, where did you go? What, what are you thinking? You know, and then they'll kind of, you know, come back to the present moment. I was in that moment. I was, when this was happening, I was, it was an emotional flashback basically is what it was. So yeah, that is dissociating. So it can, it can be the thousand mile, 10,000 mile stare. So get with a good trauma therapist. You're worth it. Do it. Take care of yourself. Go, go get this handled. Be gentle with you. And this is normal, normal. And the heavier the abuse, the more likely you are to dissociate. Because honestly, when we're kids and we can't cope, we'll literally check out of our body and watch it from the corner of the room because it's too much. So yeah, get with a good trauma therapist. That would be my biggest suggestion. Okay. Um, do narcs fake empathy? Oh, God, yes. Absolutely. They will tell you that, you know, oh, they can't stand to see people cry because they just feel so bad for them. But the reality of it is they are angry and they lie and they say that they're empathic, but they're not. They can fake it for a small amount of time, but over the long haul, mm -mm, their true colors come out. Absolutely. Um, how long does the love bombing last? Well, it depends on the narcissist. It does. And it depends on a lot of factors. Some of them can keep it up for a long period of time. Others, you know, they can keep it up until, you know, maybe a year, maybe two. And then after that, no, you know, it just, it depends on what their ego supply is needing what they're what they're looking for and what they're wanting to get so every narcissist is different some of them can do it for only a couple of weeks at a time some of them can do it for a couple of years at a time so but once they have secured the supply that's when the claws come out and they start the devalue and the discard all right what is the difference between antisocial and narcissism oh boy lots so in a nutshell because i don't know how much time do we have here Oh, about five minutes. All right. Uh, in a nutshell, antisocial personality disorder. They disregard the rules. The, the rules of society do not belong to them. They can break the law and they don't see anything wrong with it. And they justify it and rationalize it and everything else. So narcissism is they expect especially favorable treatment for everything. They have a sense of entitlement they use people. They're impulsive. ASPD is also impulsive. But with antisocial, it's like the rules of society does not apply to them. Now, with some narcissists, the rules of society don't apply to them. But you're talking about a narcissist who's now on the far end of the spectrum that is a dark triad, which is antisocial, narcissism, Machiavellianism. So psychopath, 
narcissism, Machiavellianism. Okay, so that's why you're getting confused. So, in the uh, the difference between the two is that the rules don't apply to the antisocial, and they will also have had a previous diagnosis of, I think it's oppositional defiance disorder. Is it either? It's oppositional defiance disorder or conduct disorder, one of the two. And they oftentimes will have uh, pyromaniac tendencies. Um, so yeah, so those are the two, that's the difference is that it's the ASPD is the rules don't apply to them. Societal rules don't apply to them. Um, narcissism, it's they expect favorable treatment. They're arrogant, they're haughty, they're, they, they lie about their records. They say that they attended schools that they didn't. They, you know, all that kind of thing. So hope that explains it. Uh, I've done a couple of videos actually on the differences between the two. So look back through my older videos and that will answer that question. Okay, let's see, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I got time for maybe one more. Um, okay, I give a lot of compliments and I wanna get a compliment back. Is that codependent? Well, it can be. So here's the thing, when a healthy person gives a compliment, there's no, there's no motive. There's, there's no ulterior motive. There's no, you know, I'm doing this to get a compliment. It's just, you know, somebody like, okay, for example, I'm a weirdo. People, if they're walking in front of me and the lady happens to have a cool shirt or the guy happens to have a cool shirt, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I really love your shirt. That's really cool. I wasn't expecting anything back. I just happened to like their shirt and I wanted them to know it. So, um, yeah, that might be something you want to discuss with a therapist and you want to get uh, Codependent No More and Beyond Codependent No More. Also, any book on codependency by PM Melody. There's a lot of good books out there on codependency. So I would suggest getting books on codependency and really working on that. If you give a compliment, think of it this way. A compliment is like a gift. You're giving something to somebody. And if you're altruistic, you do not expect a gift back. It's nice if they do, but it's not expected. So when you give a compliment, it's just to give them a compliment. Hey, that's a really cool shirt. I really like it. And then you go on your merry way. So if you're doing it with the intent of getting a compliment back, you want to start investigating that. What is that all about? Who taught you that? Where'd you learn that? That type of thing. All right, my loves, I need to get back to work. So you guys have a great day. Remember, no show this Sunday. The Sunday after that, we're going to be talking about becoming independent speaking of codependency, getting away from the codependency, figuring out who you are, what you want, etc. So we're going to be talking about that in two Sundays. Next Sunday is Father's Day. So remember, Father's Day is hard for those of us who had not good fathers. So gentle with you. And, you know, it's kind of like with Mother's Day. If you feel the need to write and burn a letter, write and burn a letter. And, um, it's, yeah, it's, it can be a very hard day for those of us that didn't have good dads. So gentle with you, my love. So no show this coming Sunday, but I will be back on the Sunday after that. And we'll be talking about becoming independent. Who are you? Let's figure this out. All right, my loves. I will talk to you later. Bye.